I'm Caroline. And I'm Annabella. We're here to inform you on the Downtown Library. Also known as the Renda Memorial Library. This library was established in 1932. And the building is made out of limestone and named after Morton W. Rendell. Morton Rendell was an art dealer and cousin of George Eastman. Now on to talking about the downtown, li downtown library. It was located where an old flour mill was and below the building, water rushes through from the Genesee River. This library was listed in the National Registration of Historical Places in 1985. The architect was Gordon Kelber and the library is 39,200 square feet. The style is Bukes Art and Architecture Art Deco. This library is located on 115 South Ave, Rochester, New York. Last but not least, it's called the Rundle Memorial Library because Rundle donated $5,000 to cover some of the bills. We hope you've enjoyed learning about the Rundle Memorial Library. Goodbye. Thanks for watching. Bye. Hi, I'm Ben. And I'm Seth. We would like to inform you on the Rochester subway. In 1919, the last boat traveled the Erie Canal through Rochester. The canal became abandoned. There was lots of argument over what to do with the abandoned canal bed. Eight years after the last boat piloted through the city, the Rochester Industrial and Rapid Transit was opened to the public in 1927. It was built to serve as a freight interchange for the five railroads that served the city. It was known as the subway. The subway was about 10 miles long. Today, there is not much of the subway left. The only remaining subway car is in the custody of the Rochester Chapter NHRS at the Rochester and Genesee Valley Railroad Museum. The ruins of the subway exist in downtown Rochester. The two-mile tunnel under Broad Street is in need of repairs, and there's been argument over filling the man-made tunnel under the city. The two stations that were in the tunnel, West Main Street and City Hall, have remained hidden from the public for 40 years, with little to indicate they were ever there. Here's some more information on the Rochester subway. In 1924, city officials took the first ride in the subway. Three years later, in 1927, Newark's Railways agreed to operate the subway. They already operated Rochester streetcars and two interurban lines. One month later, in November, the subway opened to the public. The fare was nine cents. The subway has 13 stations. Most of them were on main roads, like Elmwood Ave, Highland Ave, and Winton Road. In 1929, the Great Depression caused the New York Railways to go bankrupt. By 1931, all the interurbans were gone. In August 1937, the operation of the subway became the Rochester Transit Corporation's job. Later, in 1940, subway cars were painted green to give them a more modern look. Thank you. Hi, I'm Antonio. I'm Wyatt. And I'm Kyle. Today we'd like to inform you about the Flood of 1865. The Great Flood of 1865 was the largest flood in the history of Rochester. The flood took place on St. Patrick's Day in the year 1865. When the flood reached Rochester on March 17th, on Friday morning, March 17th, the water was rising 10 inches an hour. The bridge and a lot of cars went falling over for high falls. Farm buildings, animals, logs, and trees were floating in the water. Businessmen were trapped in their houses and in the stores and offices, and they only trapped during those two days what was by boat. Business was at a standstill and many houses and buildings were destroyed. There was a blackout that night because the gas power plant was underwater. The water was a whole six feet deep and, riding, and rising at a rate of 10 inches an hour. One of the people who was floating around Rochester was George Eastman, billionaire inventor and enterpriser who was 10 at the time, had the day off from school, saw a piece of sidewalk floating past her house, so he picked up his mother's broom and started paddling away. On March 18th, 90% of the streets in the first ward of Rochester were submerged. Soon, large parts of the second and third ward were submerged also. Farms, buildings, animals, logs, trees were floating in the water. When the water went away and Rochester counted the damage, it was a million dollars, but not one life was lost. Residents worked for several weeks clearing away the debris and making the essential repairs. The 1865 flood 
was repeated in a smaller version in 1913, causing damage of half a million dollars. The city grew tired of the Genesis floods, so they decided to put a stop to it. The river was dug deeper and walls were made around it. That is how the great flood of 1865 swept through the city of Rochester that dark St. Patrick's Day. Hi, I'm Elizabeth, and I'm happy to share with you my report on the Eastman Kodak Company, best known as Kodak. George Eastman, the founder of Kodak, was born on July 12, 1854, in Waterville, New York. His family moved to Rochester when he was six. When he was 24 years old, he began researching how to make photography easier for the average person. Eastman founded the Kodak Company in 1888. He chose the name Kodak because the letter K was his favorite letter, and he wanted the name to be short, easy to pronounce, and to be different from all of the other companies that were in business at the time. That same year, Eastman introduced the first Kodak camera into the market. With the slogan, you press the button, we do the rest, Eastman put the first simple camera into the hands of people all over the world. In 1889, Eastman introduced transparent roll film, which is still used today. In 1900, he introduced the Brownie camera, which was intended for use by children and sold for just one dollar. For the first time, the hobby of photography was affordable for almost everyone. In 1914, the company built a 16-story office headquarters in downtown Rochester. They added three more stories in 1930 to keep up with their booming business. The Kodak company grew and became so successful because they were the first to sell inexpensive cameras and the film, chemicals, and paper needed to produce pictures. In the over 120 years that the company has been in business, they have accomplished many impressive milestones. In 1929, the company introduced the first motion picture film. In 1935, they introduced the first color film, affordable and available for not just professional photographers, but the average person as well. In 1937, they introduced the first slide projector, which only handled one slide at a time. 24 years later, in 1961, Kodak intru introduced its first carousel projector, which handled 80 slides at a time. In 1963, the company introduced the Kodak Instamatic camera, and within seven years had made more than 50 million of them. By the end of the 1970s, Kodak was so successful that it passed $10 billion in sales and was responsible for 90% of the film sales and 85% of the camera sales in the United States. It would not be an exaggeration to say they were the kings of the photography world. Unfortunately, however, this is where the story of Kodak takes a dramatic turn. Things were changing in the film and photography business and Kodak was slow to adapt. Some would say, they didn't adapt at all. More specifically, two significant changes were happening that affected their company. First, a Japanese film company, Fujifilm, entered the U.S. market around this time with lower price film and supplies. Kodak mistakenly believed that American consumers would not desert its brand. Making things worse, Kodak passed up an opportunity to become the official film of the 1984 Los Angeles Olympics. Instead, Fuji won these sponsorship rights, which gave them permanent, a permanent place in the U.S. market. Eventually, Fujifilm opened a film plant in the United States, and its and this aggressive marketing price cutting began taking more and more business away from Kodak. The second change was, that was occurring in the photography industry, industry was a shift to digital. Although Kodak had been investing billions of dollars into developing technology for taking pictures with mobile phones and other digital devices, it held back from developing digital cameras because they were afraid they would hurt their film business. In fact, they developed a digital camera as early as 1975, but dropped it because they didn't want to focus on a product that would take sales and attention away from their core business. As a result, many other companies developed these cameras, hurting Kodak's business even more. Today, the company is a lot smaller than it used to be, employing only 8,000 people compared to 145,000 at its peak. Kodak now pro provides packaging, printing, graphic communications, and professional services for businesses around the world. They continue to try to find new ways to grow as a company, including looking at some of their old ideas and inventions to see if they would be marketable in today's world. As for Mr. Eastman, the man who started it all, his legacy remains as strong as ever. 
$75 million he donated in 1924, eight years before his death, continued to benefit communities across the world. For example, the Eastman School of Music wouldn't exist without his generous donation. His home in Rochester, now known as the George Eastman House, has become a famous museum of photography. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed this report. I'm Piyush, and we are going to talk about the history of Sam Patch. It is very inspiring, so enjoy this show. Sam Patch was born in Rhode Island in 1799. Legend says that Sam Patch made his first jump when he was a baby, right into a water bucket made of soap suds. His parents knew that it was impressive for a baby, but since it's dangerous for him to jump into a water bucket while he, at a very young age, his father said Sam should settle down and not jump again. But Sam Patch did not settle down. He jumped into the Pawtucket River at a hundred feet high, 33 meters for, for you fa fans of the metric system. Years after Patch jumped, his dreams went down the drain. His partner ran away with all of Sam Patch's money. On September 30th, 1827, Sam Patch hid behind a tree until further notice. Then he ran and jumped off the highest cliff with a height of 25 meters. Everyone enjoyed the stunt. He was immediately known as a daredevil. Later, Patch made a plunge atop the masthead in Hoboken, New Jersey. He jumped a 30 meter plunge. Word of his jumps spread quickly. Patch has new heights to conquer. It is time to jump off Niagara Falls. He was putting up flyers for the Sam Patch Niagara jump. On October 17, 1829, the tallest peak is 40 meters. Then. He jumped off Niagara Falls, but people didn't see him come up at the la until the last second. People were assuming he was dead. Then, after people found out he was really alive, folks declared he was a national hero. Sam believed he could jump off of any bridge or waterfall. He even jumped off, dreamed of jumping off the London Bridge. But Rochester, New York, and Genesee Falls were nearby. He had a fresh challenge. On November 6, 6 to 8,000 people gathered around the Upper Falls of the Genesee to witness the 33 meter plunge. He let his bear jaunt off the falls. Without a second of hesitation, Patch jumped to save his pet. The bear and Patch emerged and swam safely to the riverbank. Then he became overconfident. He was soon going to set the time to Friday, November 13th to make another jump on the Genesee Falls. People were superstitious because November 13 was an unlucky day. People advertised that it was Sam's last jump. The day was cold and blustery. Despite that the weather was bad, people still came. Sam Patch went up on his diving board and gave a big speech. Gave a speech 
why he's doing this jump. Napoleon was a great man. He conquered armies as well as nations. But he can't jump the Genesee Falls. Wellington was a great man. He conquered even Napoleon. But he not even he can jump the Genesee Falls. That was left for me to do, and I can do it. And I will. With that, he dived into the falls head first. Then he fell into the shallow water. Finally, he struck the water with great force, and he, but he never came back. Still better than the belly flop, right? Wrong! At least belly flops don't usually end in death. People assumed he was still alive, but he was never seen since his last jump. People found his body, and then after that, years after that, people would say that you could see his ghost at Genesee Fall on Story Moon Nights. Sam Patch was a brave jumper, and he did a lot of things from jumping into the Pataku River to jumping into the infamous Genesee Falls. He inspired lots of daredevils and might have even inspired you too. Thanks you for listening to my report on Sam Patch. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope it inspired you.